We're absolutely delighted that uh, Dr. Jen Gunter has joined us for this very, very special bias event for Science Week in Ireland. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. I'm delighted to be speaking to you. And uh, we've got, you know, you've got two, the one's a Bible, one's a manifesto. They definitely live up to the titles. Um, absolutely brilliant books. And you are well known and you are such a campaigner for us as women to get more knowledgeable about our bits, as we call them in Ireland, our body parts, and be more empowered with that knowledge. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, knowledge is power. And, you know, basically since the beginning of civilization, uh, you know, that that power has been kept from women. And just even the power of not knowing the names of your own body parts or how your parts work. I mean, that's that's really disempowering. So yeah, I'm hoping to smash that part of the patriarchy. You absolutely are doing it for sure. And you know, it's something interesting, like Jen, that I, my daughter is um, 10 now, and we've been talking a lot over the last number of years about, you know, obviously the onset of puberty and how our body changes and all the language and all the books that have come across about it are so much more empowering that I even see her reaction to her body changes being more positive than my associations were or what I remember like she's like look these are changing and look I've got this you know like she's much more empowered so I think I'm hoping each generation it is changing right I mean there's been so much shame imbued with sort of puberty and the onset of sexual function you know for women yeah right? so yeah you know good girls don't have sex you know they they're virgins till they're married they then then you're a breeder and then you're done and you know and then who cares that's sort of been the you know the the sort of the arc the you know sort of the the life if you will and so yeah if you if you've been sort of raised to in a society where everything to do with you know with with reproduction, with breasts, with the uterus, with the ovaries, vagina, if that's all been viewed as shameful, of course, when it happens to you, you're going to feel some of that weight. And, and also, again, if you don't know what's happening to you, that's pretty disempowering. I mean, I would say, imagine if people got pregnant and they didn't know what pregnancy was. And then all of a sudden, like your belly is getting bigger and something's kicking you. Like that would be frightening. Now think about the changes with puberty. I mean, it's not too long ago. And even still today, you know, people waking up and there's blood in their bed and they don't even know that would be frightening. I know. And even conversations within groups of friends and families, I do realize how much there's a discrepancy in like one of my friends was like, Oh, I'd I'd be really worried. My daughter would be really scared when she sees that. I'm like, but has she not seen like your menstruation? So it's the more open we are, it does set women up to be obviously in a more positive light and the first was the vagina bible are you are you still surprised by how little we do actually know about our own anatomy as women as a species yeah i mean obviously you know i don't expect everybody to have the knowledge of you know i'm a gynecologist i'm and also a vulvar vaginal diseases expert that's all i do all day so i don't expect people to have that knowledge you know just like you know the cardiac surgeon doesn't expect people to have like the intricate knowledge of you know how the heart valve physiology works but exactly. you know we're talking about the basics and i think that the way the basics is not only kept from people but also abused by especially social media nowadays so for example every single day i get tagged in an article or something on social media saying is this true about balancing vaginal ph and it's not true there is no product that can balance your vaginal ph and yet every single day there's products you know hundreds of products that make those claims and people still believe that because you know people want to people have medical issues and when medicine doesn't have an easy answer because they don't always you know, people want to believe what these influencers have to say. And so, yeah, I'm still, the, the basics are still something that we really need to get out there. 
And Jen, it's two pronged question, I suppose I'll ask the first part um, in that, like, you know, that's the danger, unfortunately, in the reality of our of our world as it exists right now. And everybody has access to unlimited number of, you know, sites and information and on the www. And to combat misinformation, that is like you do that day in and day out. Like, and you know, I, I think the one thing that frustrates a lot of people's, you know, as you say, influencers and how to hold people accountable when the information is dangerous, which often you are combating. Like you must get drained from time to time with that. Well, I mean it it is it's not so much draining in the sense that I, if every single person realized that those vaginal page balancing products were trash, um, that would actually make my job easier and it'd be better for people. So it, it's kind of like a win-win, right? Yeah. You know, if people weren't using those products and getting into trouble or delaying treatment for real things, that'd be better for them. And it'd be better for me as, you know, their potential physician. So, so it is really a win-win. And I just think the idea of giving up just isn't, isn't acceptable. So, you know, I think that the big thing that was really educating people about, about how to access information and how these algorithms yeah. are really designed to keep them in these sort of disinformation silos, you know, because the problem is, is once you click on one pH balancing video or whatever, then you get fed more. It is really, really dangerous. What about as a medical profession? And I know that each country is unique. And, you know, in Ireland, when I first moved here, um, you know, I talked about preventative medicine coming from Canada with my friends. And I'd be like, you know, get your pap smears done. And a lot of them, a few were like in their mid to late 20s, had never had one done. What do you think as a medical profession, as a, as a society, the medical society could do to make it more not necessarily inviting, but more welcoming or more, you know, less stressful for people to go in to talk about their vaginas, basically, for women to go in and deal with those medical issues. Right. So one of the problems with medicine is that it's a reflection of the society where that medicine is. So if you're in a, a culture where you can't speak about sex before marriage or sex outside of marriage doesn't happen, hmm. right? Um, you know, um, then, you know, then that sort of permeates everywhere. And I think it's really important for physicians that they have to divorce themselves from these uh, false societal norms, which are, you know, nothing to do with medicine. You know, you're there yeah. to give people care and you shouldn't be, you know, you know, imparting your particular beliefs on somebody. You should be, okay, well, what does the medical evidence say we should do? We should give everybody pap smears, um, you know, so medical evidence says that we shouldn't be judgmental because it doesn't help anybody with care and it's wrong. It's, you know, people get to live the lives they want to live. So I exactly. think that- medicine needs to do a better job of teaching that. And I think though it's, it gets, gets very complicated, right? When you're, it shouldn't be, but when you're working at a hospital, for example, and you know, you, you have less power than I think the public thinks with hospital administrators and things like that. And so I think physician societies, medical professional societies need to be taking the lead here um, because they do have, they have much more power than an individual physician. Let's talk about something that previous generations did not talk about. And I know that it's conversations that are coming up more and more in my group of friends. And my group of friends are trying to be empowered more and more about options and knowledge. And we all have memories of our mothers just suffering. Let's talk about menopause. Sure. <laughs> Which is the menopause manifesto. Exactly. We women need a lot more education when it comes to this about viable options on treatment. Yeah, I think they even really need to know more than that. They need to know the basics, right? Because menopause, many people don't even know what menopause is. And then I see this sort of, people don't really have discussions about what it really is. And then all I see are people ramming different treatments down people's throats, as opposed to, boy, this is what's happening to your body. It's actually very normal. This is, yes. you know, the menopause transition is just puberty in reverse, uh, women throughout civilization have done great things after menopause. It's not a sign of death. Um, one of the biggest myths is that, you know, menopause only exists because of modern medicine, because women are only able to outlive their ovaries. And that is completely untrue. And I see many doctors perpetuating that myth. And I'm like, mm -hmm. how uninformed are you that you didn't even bother to sort of read some sort of basic, um, sort of basic information that's widely available. Uh, and we have this amazing um, grandmother hypothesis, which tells us that women in menopause were actually incredibly um, important um, for societal structure. Uh, 
Now that doesn't right. mean that people don't have symptoms and symptoms don't need to be treated, but it's a very different thing to look at your menopause thinking it's a failure and a sign of irrelevance versus this is just another phase. And you know what? Historically, this has been very beneficial to society. There are different ways to look at a situation. And I think it's really important. It's no different than looking at puberty and saying it's associated with shame because you're gonna be sexually active as opposed to no, it's not associated with shame. But Jen, throughout history, like without having full knowledge, like it, it is kind of the way that, you know, media presented, it is kind of like, as you say, a lessening of womanhood or a, a failure or no longer relevant redundancy of, you know, whatever, you know, sexual side of your life. All of these things are just so associated with menopause and uh, like that's multifaceted about how we can all kind of break that down. Right. Absolutely. So I think that, um, you know, society is very invested in, in, for lack of a better word, you know, hot spill for women, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, which is a sign of, I guess, whatever potential breeder status, you know, whatever that sort of linked to. And then, you know, menopause has been viewed as not hot spill, you know, yes, yeah. basically. And if you're, if you really believe that you're graduating into societal irrelevance, who would want to talk about that? right? So I think the first thing we have to talk about is it's just a phase. And if you have symptoms, you absolutely should get treatment. That's why we have modern medicine. Um, and uh, if you don't have symptoms, that's great. And these are the health risks that, that are increased, for example, for people who maybe have an earlier menopause, or these are the things you should watch out for. But no different than these are the health problems that could happen during pregnancy, or these are the health problems that can happen in your 20s, you know? Mm -hmm. So we need to take the stigma of, you know, of, you know, the, the, the sort of the age, when you take the ages map of it um, and take this whole sort of societal relevance out of it and just say, you know, what, are, what's the, what is bothering you? And let's see how we can help that. Absolutely. Do you, I think as well for a lot of women getting into, you know, perimenopausal phase of their life and menopausal phase, they don't really know how to acknowledge symptoms either. Like they might just brush them off. Like, like I'm only just kind of learning, you know, like brain fog or like, you know, everyone just associated with the kind of basic ones, which is like hot flashes and, you know, the cease of your menstruation. But like, there are a lot of symptoms that people need to kind of make themselves aware of, aren't there? A lot of symptoms, absolutely. But the, the problem is these are all symptoms that could be of other things too. So it's really important to talk with your doctor. So for example, you know, hot flashes definitely um, are sort of like the, probably one of the most common symptoms of the menopause transition, that meaning the time leading into menopause and in menopause. But you know what? Hot flashes can also be caused by medications and they can be caused by thyroid abnormalities. So, you know, it's always important to check in just to see, you know, is there something else that should be looked into? Sleep disturbance, very common in menopause, but you know what? Sleep disturbance can also be linked with anxiety and sleep disturbance is linked with sleep apnea and it's linked with other medical conditions. So again, it's really important to not just, it. I, we seem to sort of live in this world where either everything is blamed on menopause or everything is ignored. And it's, yes. not, you know, we really need this holistic view to say, well, let's see what's going on. And for example, it can be really complicated. So menopause can actually be a time that um, where depression gets triggered for some people. Um, and so, and depression can affect sleep. So, you know, that it's often very multifaceted. And so sometimes there are multiple treatments, you know, that need to happen at the same time. Do you think, Jen, with your work and everything that you've done, you know, publications, your online life, everything you've done, do you sometimes, I hope you do anyway, stand back and go, I've made significant inroads here or I've helped other people make significant inroads here and talking about women's health for the betterment. Do, do you have those moments where you go, I, I'm doing, I've done a good job. I hope you have. <laughs> Well, every now and then I do get lovely messages from people telling me how, you know, something I've written has, has really changed their life for the better. And that is, that's really lovely to get. Um, and certainly, you know, every one of those counts for, you know, a hundred of the nasty messages that I get. Um, but yeah, it is, it, it's, it's really lovely when people say those things. And, you know, I know that, um, I know it, it's, it's so helpful when people have someone who can give them that information. And I'm just, you know, I, it's a privilege to be able to do that. Absolutely. But you really are such a strong force, such a, a voice of reason, of advocacy, of support. And it's absolutely wonderful that you're being part of that. You're part of this panel on Bias and Science Week in Ireland, because 
it's just elevated it for us. And we really thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. One of the sweetest things someone said to me at a book signing, um, a couple, I guess, in the before time, for the, it was for the Vagina Bible was, uh, she came up and she said, you know, every morning I check your Twitter feed, and it gets me pumped up for the day. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And but I was genuinely, like, so girl, exactly. But genuinely, like, and I think of like, like my mother would be 80 five now and she was very positive about talking about our you know periods and everything but still I think about the societal norms in the 80s and it wasn't nearly not nearly as positive as it is now so I do feel that change has happened and it will continue to get better I'm positive about it for sure yeah I do think we're absolutely moving in the right direction I think that it's everybody wants everything to be fixed immediately and I get that Mm. Um, but I'm also a realist and I, I believe that that, you know, each time small incremental changes are going to keep pushing us in the right direction. I mean, yeah, I would love to wave a magic wand and just have drop knowledge into everybody's head and, you know, erase the patriarchy. Um, But I feel like, you know, we're all pushing against the glass ceiling in different ways. And so um, it's just, you know, we still, you know, we still have a little ways to go. And I, well, I tell people when I'm at like a book signings, I, often I have a young woman step up and stand up and ask, you know, how she can make a difference. And I always say, go into politics. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. Because, you know, you have to be in the room where it happens. You really Part of the conversation. The yeah. Oh, thank you so much. And I love, like, I know these are Emer's copies, but I don't think I'm going to be giving them back. <laughs> But thank you so much for your time. And I know it was a good back and forth to get it set up, but thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And I hope you guys have an awesome conference and I hope to be able to come to Ireland one day. Have you ever come? No, you've never been. I've only flown through Dublin. Um, My family actually, uh, my my parents uh, moved to to Canada, but my my family all lives, uh, everybody who's left lives in Newcastle. So I'm over in, you know, in the UK a lot, but unfortunately, um, because every, you know, you always end up with family. So you never like go and get to see like, I know, you know, I like, know, <laughs> I, I know like one part of the UK really well. And I've never been, um, you know, I've been to Scotland once I've yeah. never been over to Ireland. And so, yeah, I need to, I need to do that because I see all these beautiful pictures of Ireland and my kids are obsessed with the show Dairy Girls. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> so good. <laughs> it's like, so I'm brilliant. Obsessed. Yeah. No, I know. I I mean, I've lived here since 1999 and I don't really see myself leaving. So (laughs) I love it. (laughs) No, I mean, I think, I think, especially in the United States, we need to take some lessons from Ireland, you know, where, you know, you guys are moving in the right direction with abortion rights and we are, we are not. (laughs) So, um, so yeah, so you're a great seat of amazing activism um, for uh, reproductive health. I think so. I think it's changed a lot in the last few years for the better. Thank you so much for your time. 